He was also the guy who got me the job in the sedan. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, today we are introducing the fourth episode of the series with uh, Captain uh, David Hunt. Uh, today Dave will talk about his uh, experiences, his flying experiences in uh, Sudan before leaving for the DC-8 uh, and uh, many other uh, bigger aircraft in Europe uh, and uh, so on. So experience in Sudan, he was flying uh, uh, the Beechcraft uh, Baron 58, Cessna 206, 210 uh, and uh, many more uh, up to Juba, uh, Khartoum uh, and uh, many other places in uh, Sudan. Uh, Sudan is one of the biggest countries in Africa but not the easiest one to live in, uh, especially back in those days, uh, due to the fact that uh, the war, uh, the civil war started uh, between the 50s and 60s uh, and uh, continue. Uh, last up until uh, recent days uh, with the outcome that we know it's the division of the country into uh, two different countries which is uh, South Sudan and uh, Sudan. I hope you're gonna enjoy the video uh, if you have any comments any question to me or to Dave uh, please uh, email, email me or contact me on Instagram if you like the video of course put like and uh, subscribe uh, to the channel. Once again, thank you very much from me and Dave and uh, see you for the next episodes later on. Yeah, so I was in Somalia for, for uh, like the first six months of 81, then I went back to, to Kenya as I've just been talking about it. So I left uh, September 1982 uh, yeah. from Kenya. Uh, so I was 23 years old then to go to Sudan because the money was like four times what you got paid in Kenya and it was kind of exciting and and a lot of people didn't want to go to Sudan because it was very primitive and and uh, no nav aids and and like I said, the biggest country in Africa yeah um but to me it was like really quite exciting so um I managed to get a job for a company in Khartoum flying a beach baron 58 they, did, they only had one aeroplane, which was the Beach Baron. And um, so I went up to, to join them and uh, st started off with the Baron. And uh, then we ended up with a Cessna 206 as well. So I flew that. And then uh, they got a DC-3. So I was co-pilot co on the DC-3 for a bit as well. But we used to jump from one aeroplane to another, Baron 206, DC-3, didn't matter which, you just fly whichever. But um, the flying in, in, in Sudan was definitely really, um, you know, if it wasn't for the Nile, the two Niles, there would be a lot of lost people. Because when I was there, a lot of the time there was no electricity. There were no nav aids worth speaking of. You, you got in Khartoum, you had a, a, VO, a, a VOR sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and Port Sudan sometimes and juba not often because they never had electricity yeah and then there were a few airfields with mdbs that were never turned on unless they were expecting sudan airways to come um and so it was all completely uh, visual flying but a lot of the time in the north you had blowing sand so a lot of the time the visibility was very poor because of dust and in the south at certain times of the year, because they're burning off the grass. Um, it was smoke haze, you couldn't see a thing. So it was very much a, a matter of, um, you know, you'd be doing a sector of like Khartoum to Wow, it's 550 nautical miles. But when you get closer to Wow, there's the River Nile appears again. <laughs> so the idea was you would, you would hit an area which you, you couldn't miss. So you descend early, find the, this, river and then follow the river to wow because if you missed it there were no really landmarks of any kind to to say where it was and you used to get quite high uh, uh strong low level winds as well you know so you could easily be blown of course and not have any idea how far of course you were and I, I'll give you an example. We had one pilot who came out. He went from Khartoum to Wow in the Cessna 404. And uh, he went down there at sort of 10,500 feet, well, no forward visibility at all. Uh, descended after he'd done 
um, flight time, which was what, three hours and 50 minutes or three and a half hours or something or whatever. Um, and there was uh, no sign of wow, no sign of a river, no sign of a road, because there are very few roads there as well. There was nothing. So he flew around for a while and then decided, well, I better head back to Khartoum because that's on the Nile. And, you know, at least you hit the Nile somewhere, hopefully south of Khartoum and follow the river back to Khartoum, which is, which is what he did. And so he arrived back like, like 10 hours later, not having landed anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> passengers go, what on earth going on? <laughs> DC-3 was a great, great old aeroplane. The one we had was built in 1943, I think. Um, but uh, it was also more interesting in that it, um, it had no electric fuel pumps. It had a manual fuel pump with a handle in the cockpit down by the co-pilot seat between the captain and co-pilot seat, and you pump this handle to get the fuel pressure up to start the engines. So it was always like, you know, the Americans have an expression, it's like being a one-legged man in an ass-kicking competition. <laughs> <laughs> because you have to, and, and as first officers, I used to have to taxi the aeroplane up to the refueling place yeah. on my own, you know, the day before to refuel it. Yeah. So you have to, pump like crazy like this you've got the, the start up here mixture here keep pumping to have 14 <laughs> like meters on pump, pump mixture pump, pump, pump. Right. and of course also if you ever ran a tank dry as well <laughs> your pressure would like disappear instantly and then you're like pumping slick on the tank <laughs> no, yeah it was a, <laughs> But we had some interesting time. There was uh, one time because in Sudan, I went there at the end of 82 and uh, the end of 83, beginning of 84, the civil war really started up again and it got really bad. Uh, civil war. So we used to fly everywhere at high altitude to avoid getting shot down. And, uh, uh, you know, always the, the, the danger of landmines on airfields because they, they were just dirt strips. And so it was easy for somebody to hide landmine on an airstrip. Um, but we had to go in the DC-3 uh, down to Bor in southern Sudan um, on the Nile River because the, the, some oil exploration guys had to be evacuated because of the, the war, you see. And the airfield, the airstrip in Bor is like, I can't remember, I think it's like 1,500 meters long. So it's not enormous airfield, but it's, it's, it's okay. But it was during the rainy season, that whole area kind of floods, but the airstrip was a, a dirt strip, but it was raised above. So it was like an island almost. So when we arrived there in this DC-3, the Sudanese army were camped on the first two or 300 meters of runway because it was nice and dry. And they had all their tents there and uh, uh, like a, a thatched roof with some sticks and big barbecue going, cooking their meat. and cooking pots and everything like that. So we landed over the top of this in the DC-3, empty from Khartoum. And then we had to take off and we got all these people with all their equipment and everything. So it's like, yeah, three tons out of there, it's really hot. So we need every inch of runway to get airborne. So the captain, Roger Tolley says, look, we're gonna have to use every inch of the runway. And we spoke to the army, there's no way they were gonna move anything. So, we swung the, he swung the tail round, you know, well back on the stick, but they swung the tail round. So the tail was like almost between the tents. The cookhouse was like two meters behind the rudder, like that, held back on the stick like that, stood on the brakes, wound it up to 44 inches of boost. Both engines going well, release the brakes, and we go down the runway with no flap set, right? And then, tail goes up at about uh, 40 knots and we're getting close to the end of the runway. And then it's a hydraulic selector for the flap and the, the gauge is done by the captain's knees and it moves sideways. So then we want to get the like quarter flap down for takeoff to get it off the ground. So then it's waiting like this, it goes, okay, flap. And you watch the thing move and as the flaps, the flaps start to go down like that. The aeroplane's off the ground, push forward on the stick. And whoa, like 
and we got airborne right at the end of the of, of the runway is like about 800 meters or something and it's that brown you know that that ready brown earth you get in, yeah, yeah. in africa you've seen anyway as we turn to the right out over the uh, over the nile you can see the camp you can see the runway and the whole camp had disappeared, gone, yeah. <laughs> blown away by the propos. <laughs> there was just a, a great big cloud of dust and, and, and everything had been blown away. Um, anyway, we had to go back there like two weeks later to yeah. evacuate some more people. Were they still there? And the army were back there again. <laughs> and we said, look, what happened last time? This is not a good idea. No, no. So the same thing happened again. Just blew the whole camp away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway <laughs> so, <that> was... <laughs> so how long did you stay in uh, Sudan um I was there in total I think about three years because I went there in September uh, 82 and I left in September 85 yeah September October 85 yeah so that was yeah through the Cessna 404 DC3 Beach 58 206 and 210 yeah but it was really interesting flying too because like a lot of places there were no airstrips so you just landed wherever you could and um but also some airstrips like north of khartoum there was on the nile there was a place called shendi and the airstrip is just sand desert sand and then there were four 200 liter drums one at each corner of the runway painted white and that was the only way you knew there was a runway there but of course the blowing sand used to blow across the runway so some places the sand was really soft other places it was harder and I went there in uh, um, for the first time in a beach barren it wasn't a problem in a barren it's quite light aircraft and stuff like that but it's really solidly built um, but when I went there in a Cessna 404 there obviously there'd been a lot more blowing sand since I'd last been there and so on and the Cessna 404 has a very weak nose wheel. And if it turns sideways on, you can't straighten it with the rudder pedals. And if you apply power, it'll just shear the nose wheel uh, leg off. And so I started a taxi and the aeroplane just got stuck like that. So I immediately stopped because I knew this would happen. I shut down, got out, and the nose wheel was hard over to the left like this. So then I found the guy with the Land Rover and some uh, local Sudanese came to help. And he got about five of them under each wing, like this lifting, lifting, and the Land Rover tied to the tail of the of the 404 and pull it backwards to the beginning of the runway onto firm ground. And then I had like five or six passengers, but I, I walked down the runway and sort of found places where it was firmer and firmer and so on, but it was like a very uh, S-shaped type yeah root and it's difficult to see where the soft sand is but so the idea is to get the nose wheel off the ground as quickly as possible yeah and of course the easiest way to do that is to have a very half center of gravity so i got the five or six passengers to sit right in the back of the aircraft apply lots of power and as soon as i could i just hard back on the stick as soon as the nose wheel came off the ground then i can straighten up on the runway and just hold the nose wheel off the ground yeah and uh, you know there's no problem for the main wheels if you hit a bit deeper sand it's not a problem but the problem is once you get airborne is the center of gravity is so far up the back end of the airplane if you suffered an engine failure you'd have a serious problem so i told the passengers as soon as we're airborne when i shout come forward okay so as soon as we're able gear up forward. <laughs> so they all <laughs> jump down their seats and run to the front and sit down again <laughs> And it, but it worked, it worked, yeah. The, the, the Civil War got so bad there in the end, the people getting um, shot down. My boss was shot down, but after I left. Um, but uh, then there was a Sudan Airways Fokker was shot down there. Uh, there was also uh, the Jongalay Canal. They were building a canal. The French were building a canal between just south of Malakal, halfway up the Nile, yeah. and a bore down in the, in the south to bypass the Sud Swamp. Yeah. And the Sud Swamp is the same size as the whole of the United Kingdom. It's absolutely massive area. And then in the rainy season, it's even bigger, but it's like about 270 miles by about 180 miles. And if you ever see videos of the Sud Swamp, you'll see what I mean. It's just a whole mass of papyrus reeds and little islands. And 
yeah. stuff. There's there's uh, not a lot out there. So they were building a canal to bypass this. And of course, a lot of people didn't like it. They thought it'd be an ecological disaster. Yeah. But also they never built a bridge over the canal and the cattle people have to move their cattle from the swamp. And then, yeah. you know, in the dry season, they come to the swamp and then they go back again. And with this big canal, it would have been a problem. Yeah. And they're all the, the, the southerners who were supporting the South in the Civil War. But they had this uh, enormous digging machine that weighed 1,800 odd tons that was digging this canal through the, just a straight line through the bush. And we used to land there with a Cessna 206 um, in the bottom of the canal by the machine to supply them with some staff or whatever. But they had a camp at the north end uh, at a place called Sobat. And the, the rebels attacked this place. Uh, and the, a chap from Kenya called Ian Tippett had several, air, uh, I think they had three Cessna 206s. I think they burnt two of them, but they, the, most of the French escaped on a barge up the river, but uh, two of his pilots, and one of the pilots' wives were taken hostage. One pilot was killed trying to escape, Australian guy. And the other guy, a uh, um, keen guy called Gwyn Mawson, he was held hostage for a year. But they released Gwyn's wife, I think, after about two months, because she was very pregnant at the time. But they held uh, him for about a year, I think. Unfortunately, he, he the, the the joke was that because he'd been working for the French, he'd learned to eat snails and frogs, which is about all he managed to eat in the swamp. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> After Sudan, I, oh yes, when I was uh, I, I was living in Juba uh, for six months in southern Sudan, oh, yeah, yeah. and um, a, a DC eight cargo aircraft used to come in there to collect coffee. Okay. and fly the coffee up to Khartoum. Um, at that time, the coffee price was quite high. Yeah. And so I, I met some of these guys uh, who were flying the DC-8. Um, and it was actually for this, this chap, Alan Stotts, who subsequently I flew for in the African International. Um, uh, but I met this uh, South African uh, captain called Leon Swanepoel, and, and uh, 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 Leon uh, lived in southwest London in Kingston on Thames and he had uh, a bunch of houses and apartments and so on so I left Sudan at the end of 85 because it was getting too dangerous and decided to go to to uh, Europe and see if I could get a job flying in Europe and Leon had said oh look me up when you come so I went and I rented a, like a little bedside apartment from him yeah um and uh, so then I started to do my uh, English license. 